transition uh, is, is one of the five campaigns of the United Kingdom COP presidency. So they really focused on energy transition. Um, UK and the special representative of the UN Secretary, Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All, uh, Damalola Ungenbi, are co-chairs of the Energy Transition Council, uh, which will drive the shift to clean energy ahead of the meeting of the Conference of the Parties this fall. We are delighted to have Ms. Ogenbe this morning with us participate in a keynote discussion with her counterpart, UK Secretary of State Kwasi Kwarteng. Following the keynote conversation, we'll have a distinguished panel who will discuss the mechanisms to improve international cooperation to achieve the visions of this council and ambitious targets under the Paris Agreement. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator for this session, Jillian Tett, the chair of the editorial board and editor at large for the US of the Financial Times. Um, so over to you, Jillian. Thank you so much, Randy. And hello, everyone. And it's great to be part of this incredibly important discussion. As you can hear from my accent, I'm actually British initially, but I live in New York these days. But I can tell you that anyone who's watching environmental issues is going to have their eyes fixed on Glasgow later this year, hopefully Glasgow, presuming that people manage to actually meet in person there as these very, very important discussions take place. So as you just heard, we have two great people who are going to be talking about what this means in practice. One is Kwasi Kwatang, who is the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Growth for the United Kingdom, who's going to be helping to steer the conversation, and Damalola Ogumbi, who's Chief Executive Officer and Special Representative of the UN Secretary General Sustainable Energy for All and Co-Chair of the UN Energy. So two people who are absolutely at the heart of this conversation. So I'd like to start by perhaps asking you, Kwasi, and I will be British and use your first names. Kwasi, what exactly you're expecting to see coming out of these crucial COP discussions and what your top priority is in terms of the transition in energy? So I think uh, the first issue that is really, really important is for us to really improve, increase our ambitions uh, with respect to the nationally determined contribution. At the end of last year, uh, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, committed us to a 68%, that was our ambition, a 68% reduction uh, in carbon emissions in 2030, using 1990 as the base date. Uh, and this really represented a, a step up uh, in ambitions. I think our initial uh, argument, our initial uh, starting point was about 61%. And we're hopeful that other countries can really uh, increase their ambitions uh, in this regard. And that's something that I think will be fundamental uh, to the COP26 uh, process later in the year. The other issue I would uh, raise is, I think uh, we're very ambitious about uh, financial disclosures, about uh, green auditing. Uh, it was very striking that uh, Rishi Sunak, our chancellor, at the end of last year, pledged that we would have uh, some form of TCFD, um, uh, mandatory TCFD uh, disclosures. And I think there will be some uh, conversation around uh, what we can do uh, to facilitate, uh, uh, you know, greener auditing uh, for finance and for in, in companies. And lastly, I would say that the, the power agenda is absolutely critical. I mean, I was very uh, pleased to be chairman of the Powering Pass Coal Alliance. Uh, as I don't know whether many of you know, but I've just been uh, promoted uh, to be Secretary of State for Business, uh, Energy and Industrial Strategy for the whole department. My predecessor is now fully uh, devoted 100% of his time and his energy devoted to COP26. Um, and I think uh, as far as it, being a, a former energy minister and also now the Secretary of State, uh, you know, decarbonizing uh, our uh, power system is number one. I mean, it's one of our top priorities. And I think we've already had considerable success when I consider that 40% of our electricity generation was coal powered as late as 2012. And today on most uh, days, uh, in 2021, it's zero. So uh, we've had success and we want to push uh, other countries, our friends uh, and colleagues across the world uh, to, have, to have equal ambitions uh, in, in terms of power generation and decarbonizing uh, sources of power. Right, well, thank you very much indeed. And I must say, I used to cover financial innovations like credit derivatives and would joke back then that I couldn't imagine a sector 
with more acronyms. And I've now discovered it. It's a world of sustainability accounting, where we're wading Absolutely. through TFD, GRI, SASB, all this nightmare of Absolutely. language. Um, but the perhaps, perhaps COP26 could actually try and provide some clarity or some simplicity, I hope. But Damalola, I'm curious, is this amb agenda ambitious enough as far as the United Nations is concerned? And how realistic is it to expect other countries in, say, the emerging markets to copy what the UK is doing? Well, the truth is nobody's asking the countries to copy what the UK is doing, but they're asking the countries to have a just transition that suits their economic growth. The important factor is, and that's the beauty about the Energy Transition Council that I co-chair with the COP president and um, um, Secretary of State Kwatang, is it's a truly inclusive club. So it's not just looking at countries from the global north and improving what they're doing. There's a lot of developing countries and emerging um, economies that have other issues, especially the issue of energy access. And that's really important because we know we cannot achieve net zero by 2050 if we do not achieve sustainable energy by 2030. So one of the great things in the COP this year and that differs for, for most years is it's actually looking at how does the economic growth story relate to energy and relate to climate at the same time. That's not a difficult thing. That is a difficult thing to do, but that's the level of ambition we need. And in terms of the UN, and again, working very closely with, with the COP teams, we are actually having having a dedicated high level dialogue on energy to look at these key issues, to make sure we make these big recommitments. And the UK is part of that on the energy transition team with, with, with Minister um, Al, um, Alok, sorry, sorry, Minister Kwatang also being one of the key ministers. But I guess what we really need to get across is that we're losing the race in terms of sustainable energy, right? the UK is showing a leading role and other countries need to come forward and show that level of ambition as well, unless the emerging economies and the developing countries will lose out. So what we're trying to do in the UN is really just bring everyone together and make sure they're key financing targets, but more importantly, there's impact on ground. Um, so we truly leave no one behind. Right, right. I mean, I do notice the reason why I've been tracking these interests issues so closely is because a year ago, a half ago, the Financial Times became the first major media group to create a dedicated platform called Moral Money, which is tracking these questions twice a week through a newsletter and really trying to cast a spotlight on all these geeky accounting issues and others. And something we've really noticed from our readership in just the last few months is rising interest in this question of just transition. Can you actually ch chase after environmental goals without provoking the type of social backlash we saw during the Gilets Jaunes. I'd like to ask you perhaps, um, Kwasi, are you concerned about the risk of a social backlash given that we have so many other economic pressures that are hurting vulnerable groups right now? I think it's a very difficult uh, situation that we're in because clearly as we were going into 2020, um, nobody was conscious of the uh, devastating effect of coronavirus. And I was uh, an energy minister at the time. We were very much uh, looking forward uh, to the 2020 uh, COP. And of course, uh, the coronavirus has really uh, uh, upset uh, a lot of the economic uh, certainties that we, that we, we uh, had grown to accept. Um, and I think that uh, the huge uh, pressure on the economies through coronavirus does make uh, this conversation more difficult. And it also may, means that the uh, spotlight has been shone on issues relating to inequality, uh, relating to, to, to fairness as well. And I think if we don't get it right, if we're seen to be, as Damalola suggested, lecturing people, you know, trying to force uh, people to act in a certain way, I think you could have a, a backlash, um, not just in, in, in Western countries, but, but, but across other uh, countries too. And I think it's a very sensitive time in which to be uh, dealing with this fundamentally important issue of climate change. What about you, Damalola? Are you concerned about a backlash? Because frankly, the data on what's happening right now in the emerging markets and developing world is horrific. It feels like a lot of the UN's targets for poverty alleviation have gone backwards dramatically in the last year. So is this really the right moment to be talking about 
energy transition? I mean, again, that's why the Energy Transition Council is so good, because the energy access story is in the transition story. If you were just talking about energy transition for someone who doesn't have electrification, then no, that wouldn't be the right thing. But what the UK is also trying to do is how do I get more people connected? And that's why it's a whole of government effort and we're, we're fully supporting it. So in a lot of developing countries, no, you're not gonna come and say, oh, transition out of something when you don't have it. What you're gonna try and show is a clean sustainable way of getting to that point, noting that these countries do have to industrialize. And like you said, 150 million people are going to go back into extreme poverty. So when we even talk about energy, it's not just electrification, it's transportation, it's clean cooking, there's a whole host of things. But what we are, you know, focusing with the UK government on is what is that low carbon trajectory to 2050? How do we get countries to, to, to grow economically and make sure we get the right gender outcomes and the health outcomes all inclusive in this in this um energy portfolio and so again it's not it's not one-sided it's not you have to transition to renewables or else it's how are you going to do it and how is it going to suit your environment your economy to make sure it's successful and um and again that is what's really exciting about the cop this year and also the high level dialogue as well to have you know, unique commitments from the actual countries to tell us this is what we actually need and the global community coming, you know, to, to, to answer their actual needs instead of dictating it at a 40,000 foot level. That's, that's not what this is about at all. Right. I have to ask Kwasi the question, probably on many people's yeah. minds right now, um, and then you jump in with what you want to say, but also please do answer this question, which is, what if you can't meet in person again? Do you have plan B? Because obviously everyone um, less travel. And I, think, I, I think, think you're right. I think, I think Gillian, you're absolutely right. I think in an ideal uh, situation, we would definitely want uh, everybody to meet in person and we're acting on that basis. Um, I, I think it's too early uh, to speculate as to what, what happens um, you know, if the coronavirus uh, 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 lingers in a way that means that we can't uh, meet. I think we'd be in an all the whole world. I think would be in a, in a in a quite a stressed uh, uh, space, if you like, uh, if that were to happen. So we're acting on the basis that we can actually, we will be able to meet. And it's eleven, it's ten months away. So uh, fingers crossed. We hope that uh, the, the the conference can take place um, as we've uh, planned. Now, I just wanted to pick up something that uh, Damalola said. That's really really important. Uh, this is not, uh, as she put it, uh, uh, as 40,000 feet, uh, you know, on a high declaration of what people must and mustn't do. Um, it's absolutely essential in the process that there's buy-in, that actually the countries come up with what they want to do and what they can do, and that it's a cooperative uh, exercise uh, in the way that Damalola described. I don't think it makes any sense to think of this or even to attempt uh, to, to try and create a situation in which People are just being told from on high what to do. I don't think that would ever work. Right, right. Can I ask another question then? Perhaps Damalola can address this first, but then I'd love to get Kwasi's reaction too. Um, sitting in New York, we've had a pretty intense week or two. In fact, frankly, we've had a pretty intense four years. Um, but how do you think the change of American administration is or is not going to affect this debate? Because we have already had the new administration join the Paris Climate Change Accord. Are you expecting their likely greater involvement to have significant impact in raising the intensity of this discussion or actual actions? I mean, definitely. We're really looking forward to the new administration. We see that they have a clear focus on climate for economic growth as well, which is critical. They have a focus on developing countries as well. So, you know, even talking to their, some of their transition teams, it seems like there's, there's a keen focus on the sustainability and sustainability in the localized in the localized form. So we're just really excited to, to get to work with them. Um, and, you know, again, if the US shows more ambitious targets, this also helps the COP conversation and, and pushes other countries to be ambitious as well. Right. Um, can I just come in on that? I think. I think that's one of the big things that's really changed in the last three months. I mean, clearly, as a government, we were prepared. We are prepared to work with any any governments uh, uh, around the world that share uh, some of our aspirations. But clearly, it's no secret 
uh, that's on this issue of climate change and on this issue of multilateral uh, action against uh, climate change and joining up international agreements. Uh, the new US administration uh, is much more amenable, much more open to that kind of conversation than the previous administration. And already my counterpart and colleague, my former boss, uh, Alok Sharma, as uh, president of the COP26, has already reached out to John Kerry and I understand had very good uh, conversations with him. John Kerry being uh, a, a, an expert, a real um, you know, brilliant international dip uh, diplomat who is wholly uh, concentrating his efforts this year on uh, climate change. And he will be a great representative of the United States at the conference. Right. I must say, when John Kerry was first appointed, some people said, well, he's not been exactly at the center of the green debate in recent years. But as someone who's tracked him closely for many years, I can tell you that he's certainly a very wily, determined diplomat. And maybe that's exactly what you need to actually try and push this conversation forward right now. But I'm curious, how important a role do you think the private sector is going to play in this? Because you know, we're getting signals um, in the moral money team at the Financial Times, and we are tracking this in great detail. Any of you who are watching and want to see this um, on a regular basis, do please follow us on moral money. But um, we're getting signals from lots of people saying, actually, the real action in COP26 is going to be around the sidelines in the private sector meetings, not so much in the set pieces with government officials. What do you think about that? I don't know whether Damalola wants to answer that first. Yeah, I'm, I'd like to come in here. This is running the show, running run the show in Glasgow, in the wonderful Glasgow. Perhaps you should go in there first, Quasi. Okay, I don't mind. Um, I think that uh, the private sector is absolutely crucial, and I've always said this, and Damalola knows that we've chaired uh, various forums together. I think without uh, private, the private sector, without active private sector engagement, when we're, we're not going to get anywhere near uh, to our targets in, in as far as net zero is concerned. And the last thing I'll say about this is that if I look at uh, my own uh, country, what we've done with offshore wind, uh, Gillian, the, the scale up of, of capacity has been very largely driven by private sector investment. Uh, yes, uh, the government created a, a framework, created a contracts for difference structure, uh, but the actual amounts uh, of money that was spent, the, 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 the money that made it happen was uh, very largely derived from the private sector. And without uh, that kind of engagement, we're not going to get anywhere near uh, reaching net zero. Right. What about from the UN's perspective? I mean, like um, the Secretary of State has already said, I mean, we've had many discussions on the influence of the private sector and a lot of the emerging economies and the developing world. I mean, what we have to realize is we have about 789 million people that we need to provide sustainable energy for and just under 3 billion people that still need clean cooking. That is going to be done by private sector driven effort. So one of the things that we're also doing is, is considering having a round table with the private sector, with a lot of these private equity finances and see what do they actually need to come in at scale in these markets in a sustainable way and really drive the energy transition um, conversation. But um, I, I can't I can't buttress it enough. It's it's critical. If private sector are not involved in this effort, you know, it, it won't be a success. And we're really happy that we've had a lot of private sector wanting to be engaged and wanting to do more and be more ambitious um, in their targets, especially in developing countries. Right. Well, thank you both very much indeed. I must say, Excellent. speaking as a mere journalist, um, since we launched Moral Money, we've seen an absolutely extraordinary reaction from FT readers in terms of interest in the content. Um, we're seeing the reopen rates very, very high because people seem to be forwarding content on. And we're actually about to launch a new climate hub to really get ready for COP26. So there is a lot of interest. Very best of luck in capitalizing on this. Thank and you. Act. Fingers crossed we all go to glory and sunny Glasgow um, later this year in person and enjoy, save the delights of Glasgow. Um, and in the meantime, just remains for me to say a very big thank you to both of thank you, you for your time. We're now going to be turning to a panel. So thank you. We're now going to be turning to a panel debate with a very interesting selection of people to talk about some of the themes that we just heard discussed from the keynote speakers. Um, we have Nadim Baba, who is special assistant to the Prime Minister of Pakistan on petroleum. 
He's going to be talking to us about how and why the fossil fuel sector is engaged in this debate right now and why it matters. Very interesting perspective, particularly coming from Pakistan, one of the emerging market countries that Damilola just um, highlighted. We've got Agustin Delgado, who's Chief Innovation and Sustainability Officer at Iberdrola. We've got Kate Hughes, who's Director for International Climate Change and COP26 in the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Apologies, I'm reading off the titles to make sure I get them correct because they're all long and most impressive. We've got Gonzalo Munoz, who's a high level climate change champion for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And last but not least, Glenn Piesoroz, who is the Director of International Relations and Special Projects at Sustainable Energy for All. So public sector, governmental sector, private sector, multilateral sector, and also the NGO sector as well. So maybe I can start perhaps with you, um, Nadine Baba, and ask you, how do you, as someone who is from one of the emerging markets, who's grappling with a lot of economic pressure as a result of the pandemic over the last year, and is a country that's hungry for energy at the moment, how are you tackling these issues, given the challenges you're facing? Thank you, Gillian. Um, most people would be familiar with the three objectives that all policymakers deal with these days, which is availability, affordability, and sustainability of energy. But we in Pakistan add two more as we come up with our policy formulation. And those two, more, those two are partly specific to Pakistan. One of them is that uh, we are a heavily uh, reliant country on imported energy. In fact, about 40% of our total import bill is spent on energy. So one of our policy drivers is that we need to focus more on indigenous resources. And fortunately, we do have a lot of hydro resources. We have a lot of solar uh, radiation areas, as well as onshore and offshore wind potential. The other factor that we add in our policy formulation is that, unfortunately, our industry is not very energy efficient. So we need to actually improve the efficiency of use. These two factors actually feed into the three original major drivers, which are availability, affordability, and sustainability. So when we take these factors, we've set some targets for ourselves. And they may sound very ambitious uh, if you haven't heard them before but we feel very comfortable that we can achieve them. So let me quickly run through them. We have set a target for ourselves that by year 2025, more than 50% of the electricity in Pakistan will be renewable resources, which is primarily hydro, solar, and wind. And by 2030, that number will climb to more than 60%. We are very, very comfortable that we can meet those targets. And that's primarily because we do have a large chunk of hydro resources in country already operational. So this increase is going to be primarily driven by solar and wind, while the existing percentage of hydro maintains its share as the system grows. So we keep adding hydro, but the percentage stays there. Now, these are fairly ambitious targets. And uh, as I said, we feel comfortable that we have systems in place that can actually achieve this. If we add to it the nuclear, which is non-fossil sources, which is another 10%, then frankly, we are looking at within five years, hitting about 60% non-fossil based energy in our system and 70% by 2030. Now, with that, we are doing two or three other things. One is that we have come up with a very, very uh, economically powerful EV policy. So through uh, fiscal incentive taxation measures and other things, which are uh, the most powerful tool that uh, policymakers have at hand, uh, we are now uh, launching a major initiative on the mobility side and our targets are that by year 2030, 30% 30 of the vehicles on the road should be electric vehicles. And again, we've done a fairly deep analysis and we believe 
that for a developing country, uh, which is really starting from scratch, uh, maybe we have the possibility of leapfrogging and getting to those targets reasonably quickly. Let me mention just two other things quickly and then I'll stop and uh, we can go on to your next question. We have also decided to go back to the basics and we have launched a program called 10 Billion Tree Tsunami. So in the next three years, we are going to plant 10 billion trees. And we did a little bit of this experiment two years ago where we planted 1 billion trees in one year. We've essentially tripled it and made it a three-year program. And with that, we believe that the reduction in the uh, carbon uh, footprint is, is quite uh, doable for us. I'll just conclude this, uh, this portion of the question by saying that Pakistan, for the size of its population as the sixth most populous country in the world, we are actually one of the lowest carbon emitters in the world with uh, roughly one, just one ton per capita uh, per, uh, per year, which is the, one of the lowest of any large population country. We don't want to squander that away. We want to maintain that advantage through policies that will allow us to not only sustain that kind of level, but in fact meet our target of reducing about 20% by 2030. So we, we are quite uh, keen uh, to be a major driver, especially amongst the developing nations, to not only meet these targets, but do our part, despite the fact that our proportion in the greenhouse gases is relatively small today. Well, thank you very much indeed, Minister Bawar. I must say those are remarkable statistics that you've cited. And I'm particularly struck by your leapfrogging um, analogy because we have seen in the uptake of mobile phone technology, emerging market countries leapfrog many emerged ones or developed ones, supposedly developed ones. And we've also seen that actually spark reverse innovation in all kinds of fields like mobile payments and things like that. So it'd be incredibly interesting to see whether we could see the same thing in the energy transition. Um, but I'm curious, before I move on, I'd like to ask you, are you concerned that the COVID-19 global economic recession is gonna make your job harder in terms of persuading the population to move to sustainable energy sources? Um, are you worried that you might end up seeing something like the Gilets Jaunes protests if you tried to tax um, fossil fuels at all or take more onerous measures to try and spark that um, transition? Or do you hope you can do the whole thing through trees and hydroelectric power? Well, it's clearly a concern that we have, but frankly, it's not a major concern. And that is so for two reasons. First, uh, the way the Pakistan government managed the COVID impact, uh, we actually came out quite well and we had a very fast V-shaped recovery. And frankly, within a matter of a few months, most of the economic damage that is still rippling through the world, uh, that was over in Pakistan. So even today, while we are uh, not seeing the kind of growth that we might have seen if COVID hadn't happened, uh, but we still are positive growth. Uh, so first, so the first reason is that we've actually come out uh, quite nicely from the main uh, damage, economic damage that COVID has uh, inflicted upon uh, the rest of the world. The second reason we don't believe that to be a major issue for us is that because our reliance has been heavily on imported energy, the cost of that energy has actually been quite high. And if we start moving more towards local resources on the renewable side, we candidly believe that not only can we maintain the costs, there is a possibility that in a few years, we should be able to lower the costs. So uh, we are not too concerned about the cost side of it. Uh, the added benefit is that today, about 20% of our roughly 230 million population does not have access to electricity. And the reason it doesn't is that this is very, in, in remote areas, very sparsely populated in the north and the west of the country. And in those areas, grid access is actually not an economical solution anyway. And going to localized distribution systems through solar or wind 
or uh, biomass based systems is actually a more economic solution. So for all those reasons, while it is clearly a consideration we have in mind, it is, it's not the primary driver as we make our policies. Well, that's fascinating. And I'm sure many of the um, you know, Western European countries right now wish they had that kind of um, you know, impetus. But um, I'd like to turn now to Augustine Delgado talking in relation to Iberdrola and ask you, what do you make about the global energy agenda right now? I mean, do you think that we're going to get fast enough um, development of innovation and technology to actually address these issues, um, particularly in areas which are currently dependent on fossil fuels sources at the moment? Yeah, this is a good question because uh, the truth is that we are in a rush, in a race to zero, as the champion says, says uh, in the Marrakesh um, agreement. And uh, yeah, we need technology uh, to achieve the goals and to uh, decarbonize the economy uh, as soon as possible. So uh, I can tell you from our sector, the power sector, that we have seen a, a, a really a, a huge decrease in the cost of technologies, not only solar, uh, but also onshore and offshore wind, batteries, electric vehicles, and so forth. And we have seen that the learning curve of those technologies, the decreasing cost of the technologies, uh, they are meeting the expectations even uh, uh, even further than that. And the truth, uh, as uh, Mr. Babar was saying before, the truth is that today, in most of the countries of the world, renewables energy are cheaper than fossil fuel uh, power uh, generation. And we have seen that in, in the markets in which we are, uh, Spain, UK, uh, US, uh, Mexico, and Brazil. So it's not a matter anymore about uh, uh, developing technologies that are more expensive to fight climate change, but it is that we have in our hands technologies that are cheaper and also fight climate change while helping to, uh, 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 to secure the availability of supply, uh, as Mr. Baba was saying before. And we have seen that, uh, as I said, in many countries, uh, and that's the reason why we are seeing an acceleration of the deployment of renewable technologies all over the world. And the reason it is that we can replace uh, in a competitive way fossil fuel plants with renewables. That's the reason why, for example, here in Spain, we are closing most of our coal power plants while increasing our renewables. And our goal for 2030, it is that after closing all the coal power plants, start closing our nuclear 70% of our power will be uh, generated by renewables at a cheaper, a cheaper cost for the customers. If we have therefore a green and cheap electricity, the, the, the next goal, it is to deliver this cheap electricity to the customers and to start making the shift of energy uses uh, that we uh, as customer already have. I'm talking about shifting uh, how we are uh, using the mobility. I was so glad to hear uh, that in Pakistan they are having a, a very big push for electric vehicles. I think this is a non-regret decision because electric vehicles will uh, uh, be uh, in the total cost of energy will be cheaper than uh, internal combustion engine before 2025 and they will be cheaper uh, uh, in upfront cost in 2027. So Electrification of the mobility is a non-regret decision for countries. And I think getting ready for that is getting the industry that is making the cars ready for this. And also we have to uh, uh, also shift the way we heat our homes and the way we uh, have industrial processes uh, uh, done and change uh, the uses of coal, uh, oil, or uh, natural gas uh, to heat uh, um, boil things and so on, and they start using heat pumps, uh, microwaves, or electric furnaces. So I think we have a very exciting way ahead. For example, here in Spain, only 23% of the uses of energy is electricity, and we have the whole room of 75% to change these uses, and I think there is a clear path uh, for economic growth, uh, uh, and uh, decreasing emissions and competitiveness for, the, for our industries. And this is a trend that we have seen and we think it's real. Can I 
just quickly ask before I move on to Kate, um, what for you is a key technology breakthrough that has to happen? Is it battery technology above all else? Because that's what I often hear from talking to private sector players right now. And of course, there's a lot of excitement right now about whether battery technology is finally beginning to get to where it needs to be. But what for you is the biggest innovation challenge right now? Yeah, you know, the, the good thing about this is that we are not relying all this energy transition uh, in just one silver bullet. Silver bullet. Uh, there are many cards that we can play. And as I said, uh, uh, we have solar, we have uh, uh, wind, onshore and offshore. We have batteries, we've ha we have pumping hydro. Uh, so uh, the truth is that uh, uh, I would say that uh, material science is helping all those technologies to decrease the cost. And uh, with all the new technologies that we have available, these digital technologies, the new way of using materials, nanomaterials, and so on, are helping the industry to meet the, uh, the milestones of decreasing the cost uh, through all the technologies that I was referring before. So we don't have just a silver bullet. Uh, uh, I'm talking about a handful of technologies that will, uh, depending on the country, will help every country to achieve uh, this decarbonization goal while uh, achieving competitiveness. Right, thank you. Well, Kate, um, Kate Hughes, you are in the hot seat um, as we run up, lead up towards Glasgow because you're going to be playing a key role in hosting this summit and driving forward the energy transition discussion through the Energy Transition Council. Can you tell us briefly what the council is doing and how it's different from before and what you're hoping to achieve? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you very much. And, you know, this is a huge job to do. And we're very keen to help um, through our presidency to really accelerate action that we've been talking about today to really yeah accelerate action towards that clean transition and really shift away from coal um, and towards other sources and renewable sources of energy. And we're taking a number of strands. Um, through our energy uh, transition campaign, which is looking at how we phase out coal and how we shift the finance that's available as well, particularly to developing countries. But I guess at the heart of this is um, the Energy Transition Council that we've just established. And this sits alongside the work on our Powering Past Coal Alliance uh, that was mentioned earlier, which is obviously just focused on, on countries who are making commitments and states and cities and regions to um, moving away from coal. But the real aim of the Energy Transition Council is to try and improve the quality of the international cooperation that's out there to help countries to think through and to plan for the transition that they want to take. We know there's a huge amount of um, ambition out there. We know there's a huge amount of um, willingness, but this is this is really difficult um, and we know that it's it's very difficult to do. So we are very keen to bring together the right institutions to help it and make it easier for countries to access coherent and compelling package of support. Um, we know that that transition needs to happen four to six times faster than it's currently taking place. Um, so the better support that we can provide to countries to enable them to make better decisions, to be able to access the right kind of finance, to understand the challenges, the barriers and what they can do, um, it's all the better. So it's about improving that offer of support. Um, in the shift towards clean power. And then we've talked about leapfrogging um, earlier as well. And what does that look like? And how can countries do that? And how can they make the shift? What do the finances look like? What do the different technologies look like? And how can we make that a reality? So actually when countries are faced with those choices, this is the most attractive option for them. We know that this is the growth path now that we need to take. It's the better growth path in terms of the economics as has just been set out in terms of the environment, in terms of job, and in terms of recovery as well. And we want to help countries to do that too in the most equitable way as well. Um, and you touched earlier on sort of the just transition elements too. So the council brings together the political, the financial, the technical leadership that is held in many of these institutions, including Sustainable Energy for All and the International Energy Agency and many others so that we can deliver that tangible difference to countries. We'll be setting up dialogues with countries as well so they can get that targeted support from those organizations as well 
Uh, we'll be looking at thematic issues to help countries with that um, and then pulling in ministers as well. So it's all backed up by that political commitment as well. So that's what we're trying to do with the council. Um, and we're very excited to be working um, with many, many countries and institutions on that. Right, right. Well, thank you. That's fascinating. And I'm sure you're working with a number of the partners who are on this um, virtual stage right now as well. And I think one of those is Gonzalo Munoz, who's really looking at this from the perspective of civil society. And I'm curious, you know, there is a lot of discussion about just transition. It's become the new buzzword in many ways. Um, are you confident that enough attention is being paid to issues of social equity along with the environmental agenda? And are there any countries that you would hold up as good examples that are actually managing to balance the transition with the needs for economic growth in an inclusive way? Well, um, well thank you, Gillian. And, and, and yes, I'm, I'm sure that, of course, in the, this uh, last year with, uh, with the COVID uh, situation and everything that we have suffered for, uh, in so many ways, is helping understand the importance of just transition uh, as, as a condition for, for the energy transition, and, and not only a condition, but something that is absolutely feasible. Uh, we, we understand that uh, that's a, a component that is critical for the plans, not only of the government, but also for all of the companies that are working in this, in this uh, trajectory. Uh, what we expect to happen is that we are capable of activating what is called the ambition loop. And, and that was somehow very well mentioned by Secretary of State uh, Quarteng, uh, while he was mentioning that the, um, the government set somehow the frame and then uh, the private sector started the investment in the investing in the uh, technology and the possibility. That ambition group that at the same time sends the message to the government is absolutely critical. So that element of just transition embedded into the activities and the technologies that are being de developed by the financial sector and the companies is absolutely critical for the government to feel much more confident on uh, using this powerful uh, dynamic uh, uh, mechanism that uh, that somehow is also mobilizing investor cities and regions all around the world on increasing the climate ambition and enabling greater uh, ambition, as I said, also by national government. One of the examples that, that I would like to, to mention when it comes to, let's say, uh, more developed countries, last Monday, uh, you, we saw 92 Japanese corporations calling on, on their government to raise its 2030 renewable energy target to 40 or 50 percent. That, that's the, the type of message that we want to, to see all around the world. I'm uh, in, in, in another, uh, let's say, type of, of country. I'm really proud of what we're doing here in Chile uh, around energy transition, working not always towards closing all coal plants by 2040, but also committed to having 70% of renewable energy by 2030. And again, all of that in the frame of, of uh, just transition, we have not only, let's say, uh, the technology that produces the, uh, the, the clean energy, we also have all of the social skills and technology that requires for this to happen in a just way. Uh, there are, of course, very particular challenges. Some of them have been properly uh, uh, referred to, like uh, in Africa, mostly in those places where we don't have access uh, to electricity, then it's all about leapfrogging and therefore developing uh, the mechanisms, uh, somehow um, not having to go through the track that some other countries have gone through. So that's a huge opportunity where we find like probably in Africa and the Caribbean region also there's a lot of opportunity and hopefully uh, understanding what is possible now and having the empathy related to what we have been suffering the last uh, months uh, that will allow us to cover the necessity of those regions properly in the following months. Right, well, I mean, sitting in Santiago, you know, you know all about the pressures of social tensions boiling over. Absolutely. Today and unexpectedly. So I'm curious, do you think that the COP26 process 
has enough appreciation for some of these potential social risks um, that could emerge, particularly again after COVID, to go back to the theme I've mentioned a few times. Well, having uh, been working with uh, the COP26 uh, incoming presidency for uh, a little bit more than a year, I am absolutely uh, convinced that they do have all of these concerns, not only in relation to, I would say, the, the most evident being uh, how much COVID-19 has changed our agenda and positioned very properly some of the most relevant and urgent uh, social demands when it comes to uh, safety, health, uh, and, 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 and so many lost of uh, opportunities and, and, and jobs all around the world. So that has to be centered also, not only as a matter of, as I said, empathy, but also as a matter of opportunity. We're now confronting a situation where the world is investing more, than, more money than ever, and that represents a huge opportunity on building back better, on really using those recovery plans in order to uh, accelerate the transition while so many of the topics that we have to take into consideration uh, when it comes to working for a, a net zero and resilient world by 2050 are totally related to creating better jobs, uh, cleaner jobs, and at the same time, uh, communities that have a much better quality of life. So those elements are absolutely integrated. COVID-19 has offered us the opportunity and the clarity to somehow understand where has been our, our blind spots that hasn't allowed us to understand this so clearly in the past. Now we cannot fool ourselves. We have the opportunity now to go forward much faster. And at the same time, having had so many uh, social unrest all around the world, that's something that definitely connects to the sense of uh, belonging, representation, ownership that the citizens of the world must have of this agenda. At the same time, we don't need a, 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 even a perception of failure when it comes to the result of a, of, of, of an, a, a moment as critical as COP26. So we know that most of what we are trying to uh, generate at COP26 is related to the proper perception that the citizens hopefully will have that we have been working not only towards closing certain particular negotiations, but mostly on showing a change on trajectory that is increasing the quality of lives of all, uh, all, all people all around the world. And, 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 and uh, Julian, we can do that. It is absolutely feasible. Again, we have the technology, we have the financial resources, it's just a matter of uh, willing that to happen. And I'm sure that all of that efforts are coming together in order to have a successful COP26 in Glasgow. Right, right. Um, well, that's a very good moment to bring in Glenn Piazorals, who is looking at the questions of energy access for the citizens around the world, and also looking at life beyond COP26. Um, are we too focused on COP26? What's going to be happening afterwards, and how do you ensure that momentum keeps going afterwards? Thanks very much, uh, Jillian. I think that's that's a really important point, and I'd I'd like to start just to flesh out a bit more the COP twenty six Energy Transition Council and Energy Transition Campaign, because here we have, in my view, a perhaps once in a generation opportunity to start looking at this problem from a political lens, from a technical lens, and from a financing lens. So often we look at either political or technical or financing, and through this Energy Transition Council project, we're bringing the three together, essentially. And this is extremely important because how often do we hear about the importance of political will? Uh, there is a political dialogue that needs to be had how often do we, do we hear about the technical requirements? There needs to be technical analysis that needs to be had. And finally, we need to be conscious of what's on the public sector's balance sheet and what has to come in uh, through pri private finance. Uh, so it's these three strands that are being addressed simultaneously in the different countries where the Energy uh, Transition Council and energy, energy Transition Campaign is taking place. 
So this is an extremely important moment to generate that momentum that can then push us beyond COP26 and push us beyond Glasgow. Uh, that's why, why this whole process is extremely critical and we are in very critical months to be able to show proof of concept, be able to demonstrate which countries can show that leadership, uh, but also very quickly, and I, I picked this up from, from an IEA uh, uh, blog the other day, uh, good promises can always be broken. And so what we do need is we need those countries that are making these good promises, especially those that we've seen over the past several months, to start demonstrating some visible progress. That's going to be extremely important. So country commitments, visible progress, and the last point, which, which I think is, is, is touched upon, uh, but needs to be underlined, it's not only a whole of government exercise, it's a whole of society exercise. I, not, not enough is, 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 is mentioned or not, not enough is, is done to go beyond these, uh, these commitments, uh, oftentimes uh, on government side and for it to be sustainable, we certainly need it to be a whole of society effort. Right, right. Well, those are very good points. I think that's come through very clearly from almost all the speakers. But I'm curious, we haven't got a lot of time left, but I was curious to know whether anyone would like to weigh in on the question that I asked our two previous speakers, which is, does it help to have a change in US administration? Are you feeling more optimistic about the outlook as a result in terms of both global cooperation and seriousness of purpose? Anyone got any views on that? It absolutely helps, no question about it. No question about it. There are, there are multiple international processes that are underway, this being the COP26 process being one of them. Um, the G7 discussion, uh, which uh, State Secretary mentioned at the beginning, the G20 process, uh, where the US has, has a very important voice. Uh, and the, the absence of that voice in previous years uh, has been noted, uh, and so the the renewal of that voice uh, moving forward is going to be extremely, extremely important. Kate, do you have any thoughts as you try and pull the Energy Council together or Transition Council together before COP26? Have you had any dialogue yet with your American counterparts? So we haven't had any dialogue immediately yet because obviously uh, we will, you know, we weren't allowed to. Uh, we weren't engaging with the transition government, but um, as uh, my Secretary of State mentioned earlier, um, Alok Sharma, as our COP president designate, has already been reaching out to today um, to John Kerry and having conversations there. And we're very, very keen to obviously engage with the new U.S. administration. And I think it, you know it does it does shift things. And we know that you know the uh, rejoining the Paris Agreement as well, and that was signed yesterday. So that also you know sends a very strong signal to the world too that actually this this is about unity across the world in in tackling these challenges and you know they're facing challenges within their own country as we all are in terms of our own energy transition um, and we're talking to them about that in terms of you know what that looks like and their net zero commitment um, and you know we'll also be talking to them about bringing forward their nationally determined contribution as well so lots of conversations for us to have with them in the coming weeks and months through to cop 26. Right. Can I just quickly ask, we've literally got about two minutes left, but is there anything that any of you worry about that could derail all this? No. Well, <laughs> no, I'm not. All right, nothing's going to derail this? What about nothing can be derailed. This is inevitable, absolutely inevitable. Uh, net zero in Brazilian world is our future, I have no doubt about it. There's so many good efforts and good energy aligning when it comes to the U.S., for example. You, we, we've had the U.S. on board for the last four years as well with, through We Are Still In. We've had almost 4,000 leaders and organizations in the U.S. for the last four years representing almost 160 million U.S. citizens uh, of 50 states. So the, even the Biden administration is taking it forward 
from from a, 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 a let's say a, a platform that is even much better than where it was uh, four years ago. No, this is absolutely inevitable. This will be definitely our future. Augustine or Nadim? Yeah, uh, I, I want to say that I'm worried about uh, the pace of the transformation. So 2050, net zero, uh, I think we all agree we have the technology and so forth, but, but every CO2 molecule that we are emitting today to the atmosphere counts. And uh, I think that uh, we have to uh, do as much as possible to, uh, to, to get the low hanging fruit, uh, to reduce emissions today, uh, I, I don't, uh, I, it's not enough to say that I'm not going to pollute uh, or, or, uh, in 2040 or 2050. Uh, uh, the commitment has to be done today and we have the technology to do so. So I think we have to accelerate on that and really um, uh, uh, take this low hanging fruit and somehow get uh, the policy rights for those uh, bigger emitters uh, so that uh, somehow to retire them as soon as possible from the production uh, everywhere with the policies that uh, are needed, uh, having the help of uh, uh, all the world. But uh, uh, I'm concerned about the pace and uh, I'm not doing uh, enough because we have a nice vision for 2050. And let me let me just Northwest. yeah let me just let me just win. I do agree with Gonzalo that this is inevitable. And in a strange way, I feel that uh, sometimes crises show that the status quo and taking things for granted are is really the wrong uh, approach. And as I said, in a strange way, uh, while COVID-19 has had a massive economic impact globally, and it'll be many years before that uh, wears off, it has actually shaken uh, everybody to the core in terms of believing that everything will remain the same. And, uh, and I think that is a powerful motivator. As far as the US administration is concerned, let me make a comment on that. Um, in a way, in the last four years, the US government was run as a corporation, or at least there were, there were uh, repeated streaks of it being run as a corporation. Governments cannot be run that way. And I, I sincerely believe that with the new administration, the governments do what they're supposed to do, uh, which is the greater good of all the people, as well as the interdependencies of other peoples in the world. Right. Well, that is a powerful note on which to end. So it just reminds me to say a very big thank you to all of you for such a fascinating debate. I've learned a lot. I've seen some signs, some reasons for great optimism and hope in between all the dark clouds we're facing today. So thank you all very much indeed. Um, look forward to seeing you hopefully in person in Glasgow later this year. And not a phrase one often used to say before, but now it certainly is absolutely on everyone's lips in this world. And I with great pleasure will now hand back to Randy. Thank you. Julian, thank you so much. Um, we are, our next panel is on how the Biden administration can build a better coalition on international energy and climate policy. I'm wondering if you have any takeaways from your session. Um, oh, I think we've I think we've lost her. Oh no, there you are. I wonder if you have any takeaways yeah. from your session uh, to go to this group. Well, I think there are really three key takeaways. One is the point that actually the Biden administration is building from a relatively high base in terms of private sector interest in these issues. Even during the last four years, there was a tremendous amount of activity in energy from companies and from municipalities. So that's very interesting. I think the second point to take away is that there is tremendous interest in working together very much cooperatively around the world and bringing in civil society and business alongside government to do that. And the third point is a point of particular passion of mine, which I think was raised so nicely from the representative from Pakistan, which is actually, we're so used in America, I'm sitting here in America and come from Europe, is to assuming that somehow all the innovation answers lie in the West. And that basically it's a question of persuading the emerging markets to catch up to the West in this respect. Actually, as we saw with mobile phone technology and other areas like financial technology, there is a case to be made that actually the emerging markets may end up leapfrogging the West in some areas. So frankly, what we're talking about now is not just innovation,
but reverse innovation. In many ways, that's going to be a phrase which the Biden administration is more likely to adopt wholeheartedly than the Trump administration, because we all know what kind of words were used in the past to talk about countries that the former president didn't like. I think the tone is going to change. Let's hope the reality of reverse innovation is actually embraced as well.